certainly the toughest union in Australia. You didn't mess about with painters and dockers from Melbourne under any circumstances. You could finish minus an arm and a leg or maybe a head. More than 50 people turned up for the funeral of Raymond Bennett. As usual, the underworld is not talking to authorities, but everyone agrees Brian Kane has personally avenged his brother's murder. In the shadowy world of Melbourne's criminal underworld, few names command as much infamy as Brian and Les Kane. Known for their ruthless tactics and violent reign, the Kane brothers were central figures in the Federated Union of Painters and Dockers, using their positions of power to enforce their will with an iron fist. Their story is one of violence, brutality, and a relentless quest for dominance, leading to both of their murders which changed the landscape of Australia's organized crime forever. Join us as we delve deep into the lives of two brothers who were once described as Australia's most violent men, exploring their rise to power, the murderous confrontations that marked their reign, and the ultimate downfall that ensnared them in a deadly web of vengeance. Les and Brian Kane were two of three brothers, alongside a sister, raised in Melbourne, Australia. Their father, Reg Kane, was a scrap metal dealer in Collingwood, who was described as a tough-as-nails alcoholic. From a young age, Reg Kane instilled in his sons the necessity to fight. Growing up in a violent household within a poor, working-class family, they experienced the harsh realities of Melbourne's inner suburbs. This rough and often brutal environment heavily influenced their eventual turn to criminality, shaping them into some of the most feared figures in Melbourne's underworld. The Kane brothers were accomplished boxers, honing their skills in the ring as well as in the streets of Richmond and Collingwood. Brian, the oldest, was a Golden Gloves boxer, while Les was more crazed and known as a dangerous street fighter. Their descent into crime began early. Les left school at 14 and quickly became involved with the Federated Union of Painters and Dockers. The union, originally established to represent the interests of workers in the painting and docking trades, became infamous for its involvement in various illegal activities, including extortion, theft, coercion, and ghost payrolling, to name a few. The Canes became leaders of one of the Union's most violent factions, known as the Richmond Mob, which would eventually run the whole of Melbourne. They became infamous for their willingness to use extreme violence to achieve their ends, a trait that characterized Les Kane's criminal career and led him to appear in court 27 times as the accused. Brian Kane, on the other hand, was also deeply entrenched in the criminal underworld. He was known for his strategic mind, and was considered the brains between the two, but wouldn't shy away from brutality when it was necessary. The brothers quickly rose through the ranks of the Union, leveraging its resources and network to establish their own criminal enterprises. They became standover men in the illegal gambling world, using intimidation, threats, and violence to exert control and extract money from gambling operations. These enforcers acted as muscle for organized crime, ensuring compliance through fear and brutality. Brian also built a fearsome reputation as a ferocious debt collector for the illegal off-course SP bookmakers who thrived during that era. On one occasion, he had a debt to collect from a solicitor's office. When the solicitor didn't comply, he pulled out an axe and chopped up the bloke's desk, smashing everything in sight. The solicitor then proceeded to piss himself and couldn't pay the debt fast enough. Their loyalty to one another was unwavering, always ready to fight anyone who challenged them. Les, in particular, was infamous for his explosive temper, a trait that ultimately contributed to his downfall. One witness recalled an incident where he got into a fight in a bar and viciously kicked a guy in the head with metal pointed toe shoes, effectively stabbing him and demonstrating his brutal and relentless nature. His volatile temper often led him into senseless public brawls. In one instance, he shot an off-duty police officer in the foot, and in another, he brutally assaulted two innocent motorists in a road rage incident, nearly killing them. With such unpredictable violence, the Canes inevitably clashed with rivals in the Union. Chief among these rivals was the notorious armed robber and gunman known as the General, Ray Chuck Bennett. Bennett, the mastermind behind the great bookie robbery, was a formidable adversary, and the impending clash between the Canes and Bennett was destined to escalate into a very public bloodbath. On April 21, 1976, a meticulously planned raid took place at the Victorian Club in Queen Street, Melbourne, 
where bookmakers settled their accounts after race day. The mastermind behind the operation was Ray Bennett, who chose this date with strategic precision. It was the first settling day after Easter, ensuring the bookies would be handling the proceeds from three consecutive race meetings. The heist was executed with military precision taking just 11 minutes to execute. The robbers made off with 118 calico bags filled with cash. The total amount stolen has never been definitively known. Officially, it was declared to be $1.4 million, but insiders and investigators estimate the real figure was closer to $2 million, a true fortune more than 30 years ago. Bennett instructed his gang members to hold on to their share of the loot and avoid drawing attention with extravagant spending. But shortly after the robbery, Bennett's mother collapsed in a lawyer's office and suffered a fatal heart attack. Ambulance officers attempting to revive her discovered $90,000 in cash stuffed in her underwear. The gang's identity quickly spread throughout the underworld, revealing their involvement in the heist. The sheer audacity and success of the robbery ignited a deadly feud over the stolen fortune. The dispute plunged Melbourne's criminal underworld into chaos, with Brian Kane caught directly in the center. Brian Kane was a tax man. He made a comfortable living by instilling fear in fellow criminals, which positioned him well to demand a share of the bookie robbery funds. Well known for his intimidation tactics, he was not accustomed to taking no for an answer. However, Ray Bennett, the mastermind behind the robbery, was not easily frightened either. Bennett, like the Canes, had deep connections within the Painters and Dockers Union and was determined to keep the profits from one of Australia's biggest crimes for himself. The hostility erupted into a violent pub fight between Brian Kane and Vinnie Mickelson, a former close friend and member of the bookie robbery gang. During the brawl, Mickelson managed to bite a chunk out of Kane's ear, leaving him bleeding and humiliated on the ground. This defeat was a bitter pill to swallow for Kane, a feared standover man whose reputation in the underworld depended on his intimidating presence. Such a public embarrassment threatened to undermine his credibility and could be very bad for business. The bloody attack ignited a fierce vendetta. War had been declared, and Les Kane vowed revenge to defend his brother's honor, threatening to harm Bennett and his family. While Brian was dangerous but measured, Les was considered a complete psychopath whose violence knew no bounds. Ray Bennett understood that reasoning with Les Kane was futile and decided he had to strike first. On the night of October 19, 1978, Les and his wife Judy, along with their children, returned to their apartment in Wantirna after visiting family. Unknown to them, three gunmen lay in wait in their bedroom, armed with silenced machine guns with intentions to kill. As Les Kane entered the bathroom, Judy was dragged into another by one of the gunmen. At that moment, the other two shooters opened fire on Les. The murder was swift and brutal. After the attack, Les Kane's body was loaded into the boot of his distinctive pink Ford Futura by a fourth man, believed to be hitman Rodney, the Duke Collins, who had been waiting outside. Both his body and the car would never be found. Rumors circulated that his remains were taken to a meat crusher in Mernda and put through a mincer. A grim ending for a man who had spent his life instilling fear and violence, now reduced to a gruesome cautionary tale in the criminal underworld. Judy Kane, well-versed in the criminal code of silence, set about removing all traces of her husband's murder. However, the underworld knew this execution would be avenged. The unwritten laws protecting women and children had been broken, and both the murder and the ensuing retribution would change the nature of crime in Melbourne forever. In the past, invading homes and terrorizing wives and children was unheard of in the underworld. However, the murder of Les Kane broke those boundaries. With his killing, all previous rules went out the window, leading to a rise in home invasions and significantly escalating the level of barbarity. This resulted in 12 recorded murders, marking a turning point in the entire Melbourne underworld. Rumors began to circulate among both criminal and police circles, leading to police inquiries about Leslie Kane's whereabouts. The three suspected gunmen were Ray Chuck Bennett, Vincent Mickelson, and Lawrence Pendergast. They were arrested and charged with the murder but were acquitted in September 1979, primarily because Kane's body was never found. When the three killers responsible for his little brother's murder were acquitted, Brian Kane became consumed with a desire for revenge. The acquittal only fueled his obsession for payback in blood. At a nightclub shortly after the trial, Kane confronted Mickelson's barrister, Philip Dunn, issuing a chilling threat. I'm going to cut your client's fucking head off and leave it on your front doorstep. 
the vendetta didn't stop there. On another occasion, Brian encountered the same lawyer in a bar. This time he pulled a gun on him, reminding him that the matter was far from settled. The tension escalated until one of Brian's closest friends, Graham the Munster Kinneberg, a fellow gangster and underworld peacemaker, intervened, knocking the gun out of Brian's hand and defusing the immediate threat. Despite regaining their freedom, the killers knew they were still marked men. Ray Chuck Bennett, who was facing another charge of armed robbery, chose to stay in prison rather than seek bail, thinking it would be safer. However, he didn't realize that even behind bars, he was in mortal danger. Some months after his acquittal, Bennett was taken to the Melbourne Magistrate's Court for a committal hearing. In the holding cells, someone had scrawled a threatening message. Ray Chuck, you will get yours in due course, you fucking dog. In November 1978, the day of reckoning arrived. Ray Bennett was fatally shot in the city court while being escorted to an armed robbery committal hearing. Strangely, after all the heightened security during the murder trial, the police escorting Bennett this time were unarmed. It might have just been a coincidence that not only were they unarmed, but they also weren't handcuffed to him, which was protocol. A man in a suit wearing gold-rimmed glasses and a fake beard approached them. Suddenly the man said, God bless you bastard, before shooting Ray Chuck Bennett through the heart. He collapsed and died shortly afterward. Brian Kane was behind the killing, a move that has since become legendary in the underworld, partly due to suspected assistance from some law enforcement insiders and as vengeance for the death of his brother. Following the assassination, Kane had fled the scene through a pre-arranged escape route, navigating a car park to a corrugated tin fence, peeled back in advance by someone seemingly familiar with the area, leading to conspiracies of inside assistance. In 1982, Vinnie Mickelson's brother-in-law, Norman McLeod, became an innocent victim of this gangland war. Before Vinny went into hiding for the murder of Les Kane, he sold his car. The hard-working, clean-living McLeod was sitting in it when two gunmen mistook him for Mickelson. The 33-year-old was warming up the car to go to work when he was shot four to five times and murdered in cold blood. Three years after Bennett's murder, Brian Kane was sitting in one of his regular haunts, the Quarry Hotel on Ligon Street. He was with a friend, Sandra Walsh, who was carrying his gun in her handbag, a decision that would have deadly consequences. Suddenly, two men wearing balaclavas burst in, firing snub-nosed pistols. Brian was hit in the head and chest at point-blank range. The shooters quickly disappeared, leaving Sandra cradling the dying Brian in her arms. Despite being rushed to Royal Melbourne Hospital, Brian Kane succumbed to his injuries on the operating table. No one was ever convicted for his murder. One of Melbourne's emerging crime families, the Morans, publicly expressed their sympathy, including a message from young Jason Moran. As a little boy when Brian Kane was shot dead in 1982, Jason put a death notice in the paper, signed, From Your Little Mate, Jason Moran. That little boy grew up to marry one of Les Kane's daughters, Trish, from his first marriage, and they had children together. Tragically, those children were present when Jason was shot dead during the gangland war highlighting the vicious cycle of violence in the underworld. Following Brian Kane's murder, Melbourne's criminal landscape was thrown into turmoil. His death intensified the power struggles among rival factions and brought significant developments within the Painters and Dockers Union, long known for its criminal activities. Billy the Texan Longley, a key figure in the Union, began to expose the Union's deep-seated corruption. Longley, who had been convicted for the murder of Union Secretary Pat Shannon, used his time in prison to reveal the extent of the Union's illegal operations. His testimony was instrumental in the formation of the Costigan Royal Commission, which uncovered extensive tax evasion, extortion, and violent crimes orchestrated by the Union. Jack Putty Nose Nichols, who succeeded Shannon as Union Secretary, also played a vital role during this time. Nichols was found dead in his car with a bullet in his head on his way to give evidence at the Costigan Commission. Although officially ruled a suicide, Many speculated that he was murdered to prevent him from further exposing the Union's criminal activities. Nichols' famous declaration, We catch and kill our own, underscored the brutal reality of the Union's internal conflicts with unfortunate irony. The revelations brought forward by Longley and the suspicious death of Nichols accelerated the government's crackdown on organized crime. The Painters and Dockers Union was eventually deregistered, 
and new organizations like the National Crime Authority were established to combat the entrenched criminal networks, paving the way for more effective law enforcement and reduced organized crime activities. The Keynes are one of the great crime families of Melbourne. They were known more for their toughness than for making money, operating in an era that predated the rise of drug cartels. Once they were out of the picture, the crime market became flooded with drugs, drug pushers, and big money operations. Guns became commonplace, fueled by the lucrative drug trade. The Canes really belonged to a simpler time, characterized by suburban gangsters rather than the big money, high-stakes world that followed. A lot had to change to bring an end to that old-fashioned lawlessness, but this transition opened the door for a new breed of criminal. The Kane era taught us important lessons. One, money speaks all languages. And two, greed and ego are the downfall of most. And that wraps up our dive into the Kane brothers, two of Australia's most deadliest men. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing to Dark Sleuth Secrets for more in-depth looks into the history of organized crime. Don't forget to hit the notification bell so you never miss any of our new videos. We'd love to hear your thoughts and questions in the comments below. So drop what you think about the Canes. Your support helps us continue to bring you detailed and engaging content. Thanks for watching, and until next time, stay curious and keep sleuthing.